Welcome to Holy Post episode 508. It's been more than a week since the Supreme Court leaked a document saying they were going to overturn Roe v. Wade, and we're finally here to talk about it. We speculate about what a post-Roe America might look like. We examine how both the right and the left seem to be overreacting and speculating about the implications of this ruling. And we examine the complicated history of abortion, including why so many evangelicals originally supported Roe, but then dramatically flipped on the issue. There is so much to talk about here that we use the entire news segment just on this story. And I'll tell you right now, it doesn't all fit. So we have a bonus segment exclusively for our Patreon supporters, where Phil, Caitlin, and I continue the conversation and go even deeper into the analysis of the leaked ruling and the history of abortion. Then I talk to acclaimed historian Mark Knoll about the 30th anniversary of his amazing book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind, and how there still is a scandal, but it's kind of changed from what it was 30 years ago. In the early 90s, Knoll celebrated the strength of the evangelical movement, but was concerned about the shortage of true evangelical scholars. Today, Knoll explains that the scandal is kind of the opposite. We have some amazing evangelical scholars, but the church itself seems to be captivated by anti-intellectualism, conspiracy theories, and partisan politics. Buckle up, everyone, because it's going to be a very full and very controversial episode. Here is the Holy Post. Hey there, welcome back to the Holy Post podcast. I'm Phil Vischer. I am here with Sky Jatani. Hi, Sky. Hi, Phil. And Caitlin Chess. Hi, Caitlin Chess. Hi, Phil. How are you? I'm good. Good. Yeah, how good. are you? You're all you're all in the summer now. You're all in your summer break. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot that needs to get done this summer, but I know, it, I just, it but does you don't have feel class. nice. I don't have class. Yeah. Yeah. And when do you leave the country? Um, the end of this month. The end of the month. Mm-hmm. Oh. Depending on how this episode goes, it could be sooner. <laughs> no, 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 no. Sky, you jest. I jest. And now it's time for the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Caitlin. Okay, so last week, I don't know if any of you were around for last week. If you remember last (laughs) week, it was a long time ago, at least seven days, maybe more. But we recorded at 2 p.m. Central Time on Monday afternoon. And then at roughly 7 or 8 p.m. Monday evening, Twitter started blowing up and crazy stuff started happening and everybody was talking about justice alito justice alito did you see what he said they're going to overturn roe v wade ah and there was a collective scream either positive or negative from every american child adult cat dog farm animal embryo ah collective scream everywhere and uh, at first I thought, did you think, Sky, at some point, oh, do we need to record an emergency podcast? Do we need to get back together and, and do an emergency? No, it never no. occurred to me. <laughs> oh, OK. I did listen to a lot of other people's podcasts last week. Oh, there were a lot of emergency podcasts last yeah. week. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, well, yeah. Was anyone out there going, oh, my gosh, I have to know what the Holy Post is thinking about this right now? Um, a few people said, oh, I hope you're talking about this. Can we get a comment? Yeah. A few people said that. OK. Yeah, I was reluctant to do that because I I don't... Uh, if you're into the Enneagram out there, you've probably heard me say that I'm a five. Fives like to collect knowledge. They like to collect lots of things, but knowledge is the <laughs> foremost. And, and the apparently worst, hexagons. And hexagons, <laughs> knowledge and hexagons. And mm-hmm. um, the five... The kind of the worst fear is is being exposed as having been ignorant about something that you spoke of. So I am somewhat <laughs> reluctant to just jump in and start talking about something that's thorny and complex if I haven't done extensive reading about it. Now, you may say, but Phil, don't you do that every week? Phil, that's what you were going to say, Sky, wasn't it? No, I actually what I was going to say is so now you are fully informed about all things related to abortion law and can speak as an expert, correct? Uh, that's not what I was. 
hot. Oh, I didn't want to do a what hot you implied. Take. I didn't want to do a hot take. I didn't want to tweet about it. I didn't want to just go off and say, blah, 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 blah. This is what it means until I listen. Listen first, speak second. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And some people actually criticized me and Sky for not tweeting fast enough in mm-hmm. positive support of the notion that Roe v. Wade was being overturned, that it meant we were lefties. There's a lot of people getting criticized for not having an immediate euphoric reaction to something that isn't even yet official, which is kind of weird. Well, uh, it is the world we live in, Sky. It is the world we live in. And in, in general, I'm tweeting less because I've found it kind of a time suck and also an emotion suck. Even worse than the time is, you know, like, oh, no, what's happening now? And did I make it worse by what I just typed out? Well, I wasn't really thinking. Yeah. So that's why I haven't tweeted about it. Caitlin, you did tweet about it. In fact, I retweeted one of your tweets because I thought, okay, she said something that sounds like she knows what she's talking about. For now, I'll just retweet that and then I'll go do all my research and form an opinion. So you felt more confident, confident making a statement? I, I didn't really tweet anything about Roe in particular. I just tweeted that part of our, and a lot of people said this, that a part of our conversations, if there is about to be a post-Roe world in the near future, should involve conversations about legislation that supports mothers and families and children in substantial ways. And that's not an uncontroversial thing to say, though a lot of people did point out, and I think they're right, that It's unfortunate on one hand that this always gets connected to this other political issue. And it's just something we should be doing anyway. Like regardless of what abortion policies are like, we should have good policies to support families. Families either need support or abortion. Not, you can't, you have to pick. No, nope. No? Okay. (laughs) Okay. So, so I, I put together my thoughts. I listened to a whole bunch of thoughtful smarter people on what they had to say about this because my my hunch was that there this was here's my my personal opinion is this is a good thing i think the decision making should go back to the states i and also roe v wade enshrined in the constitution a more liberal version of abortion policy than you would find in almost all of europe and i just that's not what we need you know, and the fact that individual states couldn't be, couldn't even be just like as liberal as most of Europe because of Roe v. Wade was, was pretty disturbing. Yeah, I think, uh, I'm guessing all three of us are on the same page with affirming the overturning of Roe. Yeah. The question is, what now? And, I mean, not to get into the weeds too much, but some of what I've read and listened to about this leaked ruling by Alito, at least the draft of the ruling does raise some other questions and problems. So the rumor is that Justice uh, Chief Justice Roberts might be writing his own opinion and pushing for an overturning of Roe or at least a readjustment of Roe, which doesn't rely on the same argumentation that Samuel Alito's argument makes. Mm, so there's different ways to skin this cat. And while we want Roe overturned, I still have questions about Alito's argument, whether it's really the best one to be making. And are there ramifications to his argument that are not intended, which could be bad? Right. And and just for the record, I am also against the skinning of cats. I am not, Mm -hmm. however. Yeah, Yeah, right. I I know. It's, you know. I'm kidding. It's just the way you you roll. I am anti-animal cruelty. That's good. I That's always good. I always feel like we need to back up and talk a little bit of history mm-hmm. and whether, you know, whatever the thorny issue is, because we all grew up in our moment, in my day, in my surroundings, in the, the stew of my immediate family and immediate community and church and, you know, geographic reason, region. And I, you know, when, when abortion really came on the scene, I kind of assumed that, well, you know, conservative Christians have been against this forever. Like this is, you know, this is, we just, we're like becoming extra against it now, but we've always been against it. And then you find out the history is, is more complex than that. And the first thing I wanted to talk about was just kind of how we got here and why this wasn't so universally agreed upon in conservative Christianity, you know, just 50, even 40 
years ago. And, and several people have pointed out, and I think we've pointed out, you know, when Roe v. Wade was handed down, the Southern Baptist Convention affirmed the decision, affirmed it before it happened, affirmed a woman's right to choose when it happened, affirmed it again in 1976, three years after Roe v. Wade, uh, and even as late as 1980, the ERLC, uh, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention, which was their, their public policy wing, which had a different name at the time, was putting out pamphlets supporting a woman's right to choose. So the SBC was pro-choice into the 80s, which is, you know, just kind of blows your mind. Um, how it changed is an interesting story. It heavily involved Richard Land, who is now the editor of the Christian Post, but was took over the ERLC and was the kind of main ERLC Southern Baptist culture warrior for about 30, you know, 20 20, 25 years until Russell Moore took it over. And Richard Land learned at some point in his adulthood that doctors had advised his mother to abort him. And the fact that she didn't and that he exists as a result was so motivating to him that he became staunchly pro-life and then worked to change the opinion of W.A. Criswell, who was the most famous Southern Baptist pastor at the time, who was also pro-choice, um, and worked to get him to flip to being pro-life. And that started to change the entire Southern Baptist Convention. That was in the 80s everybody. It wasn't in the 50s. It wasn't in the 20s. It was in the 80s. And I wanted to unpack this one idea a little bit because there were a lot of, of uh, Christians going back through history who felt, and this was generally the position in America through even from colonial times, it was okay to abort a pregnancy up until quickening. Quickening was the standard. What is quickening? Quickening is when the mother feels a baby move. Uh, the first time a mother could feel a baby move was assumed to be the first time, you know, pre-pregnancy tests, you knew for absolute certain you were having a baby was when you felt a baby move. And most states allowed abortion pre-quickening because there was a belief that that was also the moment when a baby came to life. It was like that was when you had a baby, when it started moving. And before it started moving, we don't know what it is. It might just be, you know, we never seen, can't see in there. We don't know what's going on in there. Might just be kind of just a gooey, gelatinous, you know, who knows what coming together. And then it starts moving and then it's together. There was, in fact, early church fathers at one point declared that when, uh, at the moment of quickening is when a baby is given its soul. That's when a soul enters the baby. So therefore, no soul in the baby. Abortion's not a big deal. Ending a pregnancy is not a big deal. Isn't that, though, just a reflection of the scientific knowledge or scientific ignorance of the age? Like they didn't have yes. the tools. So it based was. on the scientific knowledge we now have, that's kind of an irrelevant argument, isn't it? Yes. Yes. So what changed was uh, science let us look into the womb and say, wait a minute, it's not just a lifeless clump. And then all of a sudden it's a moving baby. It's, it's like a little tiny baby that you can't feel moving, and then it's a little bit bigger, and then finally it's big enough that you can feel it moving. But it's moving before then. Maybe it feels pain before then, you know, and, and it should be a person before then. So the argument that, for me, the argument that it's religious to believe it's a human life, you know, when it's, you know, 10 weeks old in, in utero is is ridiculous. It's a religious belief. It's not a scientific belief. No, that's not that's not a religious belief. Yeah. So um, I did some studying this week also around around um, what does abortion regulation and limitation look like in other parts of the world. And like you mentioned earlier, Phil, most of Western Europe, which is far more secular, far more progressive, far more uh, liberal than the United States has way more conservative laws on abortion. And it varies from country to country, but generally none of them have access to abortion after 15 weeks of gestation. And I wonder if part of that is the legacy of this quickening idea. Mm -hmm. Even though it, it, at 14 weeks or 10 weeks or nine weeks, it's still a human being, it's still a person, they still have this roughly somewhere between 12 and 15 week rule in most of Western Europe, because it is around that time that you have that quickening idea. But 
even then, those countries' policies are far more reasonable and conservative than what we have in the United States because of our right. politics. Right. Um, yeah, you think it was politics in the 70s that that brought us Roe v. Wade? Uh, I, I, I mean, mean, it was an extension of the direction the court was going in it at the time of finding, you know, quote unquote, unenumerated rights right. uh, in the Constitution. Yeah, um, and it was rooted in this right to privacy. And so, right. But, I mean, when you poll the American public, most people want do not want abortion completely unregulated, unregulated or or um, legal, uh, made illegal either. They're, they're somewhere in the middle and they yeah. look much more like what the laws are in Western Europe. But as it currency st- currently stands, we're seeing this breakdown where a bunch of states are going outlaw abortion entirely, including in cases right. of rape and incest in some cases. And on the opposite extreme, abortion should be available to any woman, any point in her pregnancy, and the government should stay out of it completely, even eight and a half months into gestation, which is absurd. So we have this polarization in our rhetoric because of our politics, whereas right. most other right. countries have some level of common sense, even though there's still strong disagreements, perhaps, it's not as stark as it is here in the United States. Caitlin, surely well, you're wanting to say something. I do. I do want to say something, which is partially that in line with your history argument, I think it's important to realize that one of the problems with evangelicalism in America, especially white evangelicals, is our historical forgetfulness and our our very limited understanding of our own inheritance. Like if we tell stories about most of our churches, that story is 20 years old or 50 years old. It's pretty short. We don't tend to tell stories about our theological legacy that extends beyond a generation or two. And so we can inherit a pro-life ethic and logic and strategy that is really new Or we could look at a really much more robust and a richer history of Christians thinking about life in general. Like many people have said on Twitter over the last few weeks talking about Christians and, you know, kind of changes like you've described in the SBC or other changes that just happened over the last hundred years have gone back to the Didache, this like really early Christian document that talks about Christians being against infanticide and Christians being against abortion. And that's not just kind of a gotcha, like, oh, we've always been against this and it's always exactly the same way. It is more of a sense of, do we reclaim a legacy of a really holistic sense of being pro-life that includes caring for vulnerable people in our community? I mean, that kind of document exists within a community that was known for its time for caring for those infants that were left out, especially girls that were less prioritized, caring for women who were pregnant or women who were abandoned by their husbands or women who were widowed and needed protection. And so when we think about what our historical position is, we first have to think our immediate historical context that shapes the logic and strategy that we use, but then to look at our larger historical legacy and say, is there a mismatch between a really robust Christian ethic for life and also for flourishing communities and for caring for the vulnerable? And do I want to root my pro-life strategy and the logic that I'm using when it comes to politics today in that broader, richer tradition? Or do I want to just stay with whatever was just immediately handed down to me, which as we've seen, as people have looked at the history of evangelicalism and politics, has not been a good legacy that we want to claim, at least not wholly. There might be elements of it that we want to claim, but not all of it. And thinking along both of those historical lines, like my immediate context that shapes me in some positive ways and some negative ways, and then a broader history that I could go back to for resources, but I don't tend to go to because it doesn't seem like it's mine, even though it is. Right, right. Uh, that's uh, that's a valuable point. Um, so my point about the the quickening thing is that it really was a myth. You know, there there really there was no such thing. But we had kind of figured out. I think we're happy with this system. I think we've figured out a line. You know, and we're happy with it. But it was based on a myth. And the more science led us, you know, ultrasounds and the movie The Silent Scream, and there were some key moments in in time where we got a a peek into the womb pre quote unquote quickening and said, no, that's crap. That was crap. You know, there's no such. It's it's a baby. Um, and that led to a much more, you know, kind of an all or nothing, like either it's a baby all the way or it's not a baby at all. You know, either abortion for nine months 
or no abortion ever. Um, and it's led to more of this polarization. So the next thing I wanted to talk about as people, you know, because for 50 years, people have been arguing we have to overturn Roe v. Wade. And another group has been arguing we have to protect Roe v. Wade for 50 years. And so now that it is upon us that it may be being overturned, people are overreacting on both sides. So first I wanted to hit kind of how the, the overreactions that I'm seeing on the right, which is, you know, where some people are just celebrating it. This is it. We're ending abortion. You know, this is finally, um, and you see kind of the same overreaction on the left of they're banning abortion. You know, they're, the, the uh, SCOTUS is banning abortion in America. And n- neither of that is true. We're not ending abortion, you know, in, in Sky's, I say Sky's abortion video because I'm tired of being blamed for it. Um, <laughs> But, you know, we pointed out the, the uh, Guttmacher, Guttmacher Institute study that predicted maybe there'll be a 13 percent reduction in abortion nationwide if Roe v. Wade is overturned. And that's, and that's primary- coming from a very pro-choice group who would have the incentive to inflate that number in order to right. frighten people into supporting their work. And that's primarily because the states that will prohibit abortion also happen to be mostly except for a couple exceptions, the states where the fewest abortions take place. Mm -hmm. And the states that are protecting abortion in their state constitutions and, you know, with specific laws are the states where the vast majority of abortions take place. Can I add something to that stat that I looked up this week? Oh, yes. So remember last year, uh, Texas passed that law banning abortion after six weeks. Oh, did that happen? Right. And there's plenty of women who don't even know they're pregnant at six weeks of gestation. So right. it, was a, it was a very, very, you know, kind of groundbreaking regulation at the time. Well, the New York Times published data that shows abortion, this is a quote, abortions at Texas clinics fell by half when they passed that law, which it sounds dramatic, right? A 50% reduction in, in abortions in Texas. However, many women were able to obtain abortions in neighboring states or by ordering pills online, resulting in an overall decline of only 10%. Oh, interesting. In, in so, Texas? In Texas. Okay. So, and that just goes along with the Guttmacher Institute stuff that right. I think it's probably high, but they say 13% overall nationwide reduction in abortions by overturning Roe. So is that good? Yeah, absolutely. But it's not the decisive end of abortion and victory that some people on the right are claiming it is. And, and to right. Caitlin's point, it just shows there's a lot more and a more comprehensive vision that needs to be taken hold of here in caring for women. So, so the problem with the overreaction on the right is that if a woman wants an abortion now, they all they need is access to a medication abortion, which can be done through the mail, according to current FDA guidelines, or access to a car. If they have access to one of those two things, there's a pretty good chance you can still get an abortion. Well, especially if you if you have the means. A lot of, that's the argument yes. most people have made is, you know, if you have the ability to travel, if you're in a southern state that's, you know, landlocked by other southern states that have restrictor have stricter it becomes harder and then yeah. and then Florida becomes very key cuz and yeah. abortion yeah, other, is likely to stay legal in Florida. One other statistic that I, the left has been shouting a lot about, but I think has definite implications for those of us uh, not as far left or more to the right, is that 50% of all abortions in this country uh, occur among women who are below the poverty line. Mm-hmm. So this disproportionately impacts poor women, Yeah, which hey, means- We were uh, talking about the overreaction on the right, Sky. I know, but that's but that's part partly affects the right also, which means if we really on the right want to reduce the number of abortions, we have to deal with the economic realities that lead many women to pursue them in the first place. So anyway, it's not okay. just about changing laws. That's a piece of this, no doubt, mm-hmm. but it is about the economic dynamics as well, which interestingly, a lot of people on the right are not incentivized to change because their politics doesn't lend themselves to those issues. Okay. Overreaction on the left. This is just the beginning of all the rights that conservative Christians are going to take away from us (laughs) because Roe v. Wade was built on the right to privacy, uh, ruining it in the Constitution, on the right to privacy in the Bill of Rights, And let's look at the other decisions that are also rooted in the right to privacy. Oh, Obergefell, 
the right to gay marriage, also rooted in the right to privacy. And I forgot the name of the, the uh, Griswold, which is the right to uh, buy, have access to contraception, also rooted in the right to privacy. And uh, loving versus whatever, uh, the right to interracial yeah. marriage was also rooted in the right to privacy. And you go all the way back, where does it start? I think uh, my brother Rob talked about this on an early podcast. All of those right to privacy conversations start, go back to a decision in, in 1917, 1918 in Nebraska, when in the middle of World War One, anti German sentiment was so high that no, the state of Nebraska banned uh, the instruction of, of the language German to children in the home. So German parents were precluded from teaching German to their children because we don't like Germany right now. And uh, the Supreme Court said that is unconstitutional because the government is entering the home, the private home, and entering the relationship with a parent and a child. And we believe that there's a right to privacy in the home. And it was off of that start, that was the beginning of the string that led all the way through and contraception and interracial marriage uh, and the striking down of anti-sodomy laws and uh, Roe v. Wade and Obergefell. So people on the left, are kind of going through this handmaid's tale doomsday scenario of what they really want to do is unravel all of those rights. The next one that's going to go is contraception and we're going to lose access to contraception. And they probably want to get rid of interracial marriage too, because conservative Christians are all racists and they're going crazy about yeah, that. I'm, I'm sure justice Thomas wants to overturn yeah, that. Right. Even <laughs> he's in an interracial marriage. So yeah, there's definitely some hysteria on the left, but yeah, uh, in some of my reading and listening to the stuff this week, I it's not completely bonkers, and and here's why. Uh, there's a this quote in Justice Alito's leaked ruling that says, uh, "quote The inescapable conclusion is that the right to abortion is not deeply rooted in the nation's history or traditions." End quote. So the argument here is when you have unenumerated rights, that means a right that is not explicitly named in the Constitution, it has to be found somewhere else. And, and the argument that Alito and others are putting forward here is it needs to be something that in American history was just always assumed to be a right, even though it wasn't written down. Going back to your parents teaching German to their children, it's always been assumed throughout American history that a parent has a right to educate their child how they want. That's just been there. And so when the courts ruled in favor of parents having a right to educate their kids, they were just acknowledging something that we've already known all the way. Alito saying, hey, when you look at history, there's no like assumed right to an abortion in American history. And because it's not explicit in the Constitution, we shouldn't enshrine it in our law now. The problem with that, and I thought Sarah Isger made a really great point when talking to David French about this on one of their advisory opinion podcasts this week, which we could link to, is she said, well, the problem with that is Throughout most of American history or pre-American history, going back before the founding, women didn't have the vote. Women's voices were not heard in discussions about rights, nor did African Americans. So it was a male, a white male dominated environment. So how do we know if 200 years ago there wouldn't have been a right to an abortion if women had the right to vote or were involved in the government? Or how do we know there wouldn't have been a right? to interracial marriage if more African-Americans have been allowed to vote or speak up in public or have some say in, in the government. So simply appealing to history is not good enough to determine what rights we have because history is not unbiased. So that's my one problem with Alito's argumentation is I don't think it's enough. And in that regard, I think there is some legitimate concern on the left, but I don't think it goes as far as they're yeah. worried about. Yeah. And I, I believe David French's retort to Sarah Isker was that many of those rights, like uh, probably gay marriage, uh, you know, education of children could be established in other arguments other than privacy. Yeah. And you can make other arguments and get to the same place. You don't have to hang it all on finding a right to privacy on those issues. Right. But that would require uh, <laughs> a lawsuit coming up to make a ruling yes. that would, and and you do risk some elements of the law as it exists. This is the whole Roe argument. Like I, I, many people think, even Ruth Bader Ginsburg thought Roe was a badly decided and poorly argued ruling. But the risk is always if you get rid of Roe and replace it with something else, what do you lose peripheral to it? 
And mm-hmm. same thing with interracial marriage, education, gay marriage, contraception, all these things built on the right of privacy. You may be able to establish those things on a different foundation, but you might lose some element of protection for those things but, because the ruling is based on something but different. I had this conversation with my brother yesterday, the law school dean, because we were talking about the same thing. And he said, for that would happen, a state would have to pass a law banning gay marriage that would then go to the courts, that would then go all the way up to the Supreme Court to be decided on. And we are aware of no state where there is a groundswell of support to overturn gay marriage, unlike the groundswell of support to overturn Roe v. Wade, which has been organized for 50 years. Caitlin. Yeah, but to your point, Phil, Caitlin. Caitlin. five, eight, ten Caitlin. years after Roe, there wasn't a groundswell to overturn it. Oh, it took decades to no, get Cath- that. Catholics in the North wanted to overturn it right away. But there wasn't enough of them. I know, but it was there. It was there. Caitlin wants to say something. I, yeah, I do, which is just to say that... Um, I listened to both of those advisor, advisory opinions um, episodes, and people should go listen to them. This is interesting. But yeah. back to Phil's point, which I think is still important, which is we have a tendency on both sides to get apocalyptic with our language. And it is so, it's not only unhelpful because it makes everything an existential risk, it's also unhelpful because one of the things I saw on Facebook posts and Twitter posts and Instagram posts was also just language about the other side that assumed a ton of motivation and intention that was just evil from either side and turned it into this existential good versus evil kind of fight. And Michael Ware interestingly wrote an article before, I think it was before all of this happened in CT about kind of the existential nature that some of our politics can take and made a point that I've made before too, that I just think is so important for us to reclaim for Christians politically, which is one of the best gifts that we can offer as people who believe in the resurrection is refusing to capitulate to existential politics. And I just have never quite so clearly until this last week seen online in real life in all sorts of different venues, the connection between that apocalyptic thinking and the way we think and treat other people. If the risk is existential, it's not just I can justify doing anything myself to get it, whether it's every court case is all going to, it's all going to fall down from here and we're living in dystopian handmaid's tale, or whether it's This is, you know, murder and it's the most important fight of our life. And so we have to justify voting for any kind of Republican candidate to get the Supreme. Either way, it's not only that it justifies anything I do to get to my goal because the existential risk is happening. It's also anyone who is against me must just not be able to see this. They must be stupid or or immoral. They must be evil. They must be on the side of, of the evil people that are trying to destroy my community and the world. And it's just... This is such an opportunity, I think, post row for communities to actually do the work of politics, which is hashing out our deep differences with each other in our immediate communities and working out restrictions that are reasonable for us. And it's so hard to imagine switching from the way that abortion has been talked about as just political, you know, football to okay, actually now there are laws that could be really bad. I mean, I'm pro-life, but there are some people pushing some laws in state legislatures that don't recognize some really reasonable exceptions and some important medical distinctions. We end up with really bad laws when we're not willing to work together and do the actual work of politics of hashing out our differences and making compromises and listening to each other. And we can't do that if our politics have that existential edge. And I think I had started to a little bit believe that that was mostly a problem on the right. And it is 100% not. Like if you got on Twitter in the last week, it's just, it messes with everything on both sides. And it not only messes with that risk, but it makes us view each other in just really horrible terms. Right. Here's a uh, a headline from the left last week. Alito is taking us back to the 17th century. (laughs) That's pretty amazing to undo a ruling from 1973 that takes us back to the 17th century. Wow. It's, I didn't read the article. Yeah, the, uh, the headline could have been, or should have been, Alito wants to take us back to 1972. That, that would be very supportable, but it wouldn't get you to click on it. Right. Barely. Exactly. This <laughs> 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 right. actually wants to take us back to early 1973, I think is all, all he's aiming for. Okay. So I, I came up with some upsides, and I want to know if you guys agree with these. Are these upsides legitimate? Uh, benefits of, you know, overturning Roe v. Wade. And then I also came up with uh, some downside. And I want to know if you guys agree with me on that. Okay. Okay. Before you do that, though, Phil, can we just reiterate again, because this is getting lost throughout all of this. Yes. This is not certain. 
Yeah. Yes. Right. There is a real chance that when the final ruling comes out later and it's who different. knows when, it, it may not overturn Roe. Okay. Or for a different it, reason. Or for a very different reason that has a different effect. Right. So okay. it, right. this okay. is so premature. Okay. I'm but, prematurely looking for upside and downside okay. of the hypothetical situation. But yeah. I mean, most court watchers think it's headed in this direction. Most yes. Court. But yes. Who, now with events, who knows? There's some saying that they could even rehear the case. What? No. I yeah. That. You're talking crazy. I know. Okay. okay. Can I continue, Sky? <laughs> mm-hmm. Sorry. With my hypothetical upsides and downsides based on this continuing in the direction it's going in right now. Okay. okay. Are you good I, with that? I just, you know, I don't want people counting their chickens don't, before they hatch. Yeah, you need a better metaphor. Uh, oh. No, never mind. Okay. Uh, <laughs> upside. Upside. Abortion rates will continue to fall. True. Can't dispute that, right? Yeah. Probably at a slightly accelerated rate for a year or two. But what Maybe. we pointed out in our video about abortion, the current rate of abortion in the United States is already lower than it was pre row in yeah. 1973. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. So. I'm not disputing that. Well, I'm just saying if we want abortion rates to fall, they're likely to continue falling. Yes. The one, I, I think that's probably generally true, but I do think that one of the potential concerns is people who might bring some political energy to either state laws and or the laws that have actually decreased abortions, policies that support families and children, won't be convinced to do that kind of work because right. they think they think they've done the good thing for pro-life cause or for families or whatever. Mm -hmm. They've ended abortion. Roe v. Wade, that was okay. the whole goal. And they won't continue. So there could be a lack things. of emphasis on other things that contribute to the reduction of yeah. Abortion. And I want to come back to that later because okay. I think we have a historical example of this okay. going badly. We can put that yeah. in the downside category. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this could, and this I'm really going out on a limb here, could motivate a change in behavior if you know abortion may not be available. Maybe you're less likely. I'm mean, Sarah Isker told a really interesting story on one of those one of those podcasts where she's when she was in college, she was pro-choice. And someone said, would you want to come to a pro-choice rally in D.C.? And she thought, oh, free trip to D.C. I'm pro-choice. Sure. So she got on the bus, was sitting next to a woman, um, an older woman who said, yeah, I've had six abortions and I basically use it as my birth control. And Sarah Isker said, I got on the bus pro-choice and got off the bus pro-life <laughs> just because of that. So just the notion that it's it's it will be hard to get an abortion, does it change behavior and people are less likely to take the risk of pregnancy? <sighs> Who knows? I but I I with the availability of chemical abortion and the availability of abortion. Yeah medication pills over the internet stuff. I don't know. I don't, we don't know how much this is going to affect the actual rate and behavior, but okay. Caitlin. maybe. Caitlin, tell him how he's wrong. I'm not, I, yeah, I don't know that I, I'm not, I'm not certain about that. I do think okay. on one hand, like Sky said, economic realities are a huge, you know, driver of abortions. And so those need yep. to be attended to. But also the other thing that I think could we could lose sight of if people feel like, oh, Roe v. Wade was overturned, the fight's over, is that a huge part of it, especially for higher income women, is not just economic realities, but the stories that we have started to believe about what makes a good life and what kind of um, communities and families we want to live in. And I worry that we have, I mean, I know, I don't worry. I know we have not done a good job of describing both creating the conditions policy-wise and economic-wise for women to flourish with children, but also that we have told stories about the world, either about women staying at home and taking care of children and men having no responsibility for child raising, or stories that say the only fulfilled life is a career, you know, climbing the corporate ladder kind of life. Both of those stories, one both very different from each other, end up creating a story for a lot of women that says, if I have a child, that's the end of my career, or that's the end of mm -hmm. my life, or there's something really awful. I think we need to be thinking about economic realities, but I also think we need to just tell better stories about families in which not only women can flourish well as mothers, but also families and larger families than just nuclear families where children are cared for. So it doesn't feel like it's 
the end of a career or the end of like my life outside the home or right. that none of those stories are true. I think we need to tell better stories. And I worry that that kind of change doesn't just happen because of restrictions on abortion. That kind of change requires different stories for us to tell. Oh, okay. So you're, you're not really, okay. So I'm, I'm over two, uh, <laughs> but number three, even if the overall abortion rate doesn't drop dramatically, which it's unlikely it will, there should be a significant decrease in second and third trimester abortions because medication abortions can only happen in the first trimester. Um, so the ones that are more accessible, it, it seems like it will put more pressure on women to decide quickly. Uh, again, I'm, I don't, I'm going to disagree. Sheesh, because in many, many states that are going to further restrict abortion if Roe is overturned, they yeah. already have policies and laws against later term abortions mm -hmm. in place. And the states that have the most abortions, New York, California, Illinois, have the least restrictive abortion laws that permit them far later in pregnancy. So oh. you have a patchwork, but it's just like the the rate overall, it's not going to be that affected because the places that are going to restrict it more have the fewest abortions already. Same thing with later term abortions. Okay, good. So this is going great. So I'm 0 for 3. <laughs> Number four, maybe this could bring some peace to the issue of abortion at a national level. And I saw someone, oh, Peggy Noonan wrote that maybe both parties can now go back to worrying about other things. It doesn't look that way. <laughs> I think they've been worrying about other things. Like that, that, but yeah, but the like the litmus test for candidates that you can't be a pro-choice yeah, democrat yeah. or a pro-life democrat and you can't be a pro-choice republican that maybe we we end that. We've talked about this a bunch that most of the time even in the last two elections when people are ranking the things that are most important to them they don't tend to be abortion. Yeah. You know ultimately this issue will never ever ever go away unless there is a constitutional amendment one way or the other. And I, I don't see that That's happening. That's not going to happen. It's That's not going to happen. So this is I, not going to go away. Yeah. I yeah. do think, though, Phil, there is something really to be said for some movement, at least, towards thinking about state laws as opposed to this being a national issue in the yeah. sense that, like a lot of people have said, there is this chunk of states where it is an actual open question, what kind of restrictions will be at play. And I do think it would be good for us I mean, I have no I have no actual expectations that states will just have these really great orderly conversations, conversations about uh -huh. what we're going to no, do. You don't but, think that'll but I, but I do <laughs> hope, I hope that we could find like moments where we try and do that at the, at the very least so that we could try and figure out, like I said, if you're in a state that isn't going to just have real like intense restrictions or a state that's going to have almost no restrictions, could we actually have a conversation about what reasonable restrictions right. look like? To do right. that, though, Caitlin, you have to be in a purple state where there's an incentive yeah. to That's dot I mean. log and compromise. There aren't yeah. that many purple states, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm not like super expecting well, a lot of this, but I do hope that if there are some states where that could happen, it could help us have examples of like yeah, what this even looks like. It's it's up in the air in Wisconsin. It's up in the air in Michigan. It's up in the air in Florida, how it comes out. So those are three significant, you know, population states that will have to figure something out. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. See if the cheeseheads can lead the way forward. Okay. Okay. So all none of my upsides are any good. That's what we've learned. What? what? I don't no, know about that. There are some there, good things. I think there's potential that we just don't know. Some of the things okay. you we don't know. stipulated we don't know. or suggested we don't, we don't know. Downside, and and this is the big one for me. Who is the most affected? Uh, women without resources. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have money, if you can travel, if you can get to another state, you can still have an abortion. If you don't have the resources to do that, you can't. So many of the women that will end up uh, having children that did not want to will have children into really unfortunate circumstances. Or so, will get an illegal abortion that's more harmful to them. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if you care about the flourishing of humans, of women and children, you have to be concerned about what's going to happen, um, you know, and, and is really is the only thing we care about that people aren't 
aborted or just is the only thing we care about that abortion is not legal. If that's yeah. really all we care about, then we don't care if we're putting kids, more kids into abject poverty. We don't care if we're putting more kids into abusive homes. We just care that they didn't get aborted or at least not legally. What you're describing is the difference between a comprehensive solution to abortion and a symbolic victory over abortion. And right. this is where I think that we have a historical precedent when it comes to slavery that we need to go back and look at, particularly if you are celebrating the potential overturning of Roe. This is the moment of truth. This is the danger. And what I mean by that is in the 19th century, there was for 50 years before the Civil War, a growing abolitionist movement in the United States, especially among Northern whites, Christians, who saw slavery as uh, an, an undeniable evil against God. And that grew and grew and grew. And then they finally got to the point where in the midst of the Civil War and then the 13th and 14th Amendments, slavery ended in the United States. But here's the problem. There were, this is an oversimplification, but there were kind of two factions within white Northern abolitionism. One faction said, uh, slavery is an evil and God is punishing the United States or withholding his blessing as long as we have legal slavery in this country and they wanted to overturn it. Well, once it was overturned, then the question became, what do we do with all these former slaves? And one side said they need to go back to Africa. There was a whole American colonization society. They created mm -hmm. the country of Liberia to expatriate or, or repatriate former slaves to Africa. So essentially they wanted to end slavery, but they didn't want to integrate with African Americans in society. And so for them, ending slavery was ultimately about securing God's blessing for America because they thought as long as slavery existed, God won't bless us. But it wasn't really caring about those who had been enslaved. Then there was another group who said, yeah, we need to end slavery in, in America. It's evil. It's terrible, but they also believed in the true equality and dignity of African Americans, many of whom had families who'd been here longer than European Americans, many of whom, all of whom labored and built this country and had equal right to share in its prosperity and opportunity. And because there were so many Northern whites who really still held on to white supremacy and didn't believe in equality, we didn't solve that problem after the end of racism. And we ended up with a failure of reconstruction and a hundred years of Jim Crow. And similarly, we're in that same spot with abortion. There are some people who want to end abortion because they think it's a stain on America and God won't bless us. But now that we've overturned Roe, great, we're clean. We don't have to do anything else. And then there's others who think, well, we, yeah, we need to turn the law around and change those things, but we need a comprehensive solution that actually cares for these women, cares for families, creates economic opportunity, paid family leave, access to health care, all that stuff to make sure that fewer women who are pregnant are incentivized to choose abortion. So that's the I, I that's what worries me is like 150 years mm -hmm. ago, people are going to see this. Oh, this is the victory. God's on our side again. We don't have to do anything more. And that scares me right now. Yeah. Okay. And that we, we're running out of time, but we're going to link to an article in the show notes uh, that was in the Atlantic this week from Daniel K. Williams called The Southernization of the Pro-Life Movement. Uh, what happens when a campaign led by Northern Catholics was captured by Southern Evangelicals? And he goes back through the history of all the early pro-life, you know, anti-abortion activists were Catholics. And it was because it was a Catholic church policy. And most evangelicals thought it was a Catholic thing. It was just something the Catholics were really obsessed with because, you know, if it's before quickening, what's the big deal? Um, and so the early anti-abortion activists were in places like Massachusetts and Rhode Island, um, the state legislatures that presented the strongest defiance to legaliz legalizing abortion were those of the heavily Catholic states of the Northeast. Barely 10% of Massachusetts legislatures supported legalizing abortion in 1973. The Massachusetts state legislature responded to Roe by passing a bill prohibiting abortion after the 20th week of pregnancy. Rhode Island's state house presented even stronger opposition 
proposition, it kept abortion clinics out of the state until 1975, when its anti-abortion law was overturned by a federal court. In the meantime, there were abortions happening legally um, in many Southern states who just weren't on that bandwagon yet. The Protestant states, and the same thing was true in Europe, where the Protestant countries liberalized their abortion laws, while the Catholic countries were keeping abortion uh, prohibited. So that changed every, it, it, it changed in the U.S. and nowhere else, where Northern Catholics uh, over the last 50 years started to move away from the teaching of the church on issues like abortion and contraception, and Southern evangelicals picked up the cause with a vengeance, um, and that became you know, the, driving, uh, uh, the drivers behind much of the, the pro-life movement. The issue there is, and this is why this article is worth reading, is that Northern Catholics had a ho more holistic view of how to help families, of, of the flourishing of humanity. And it was you know, more access to health care. It was fighting against poverty. It was more education. Uh, so there was a whole um, stopping or decreasing abortion was part of a holistic view of a flourishing life. For Southern evangelicals, they had already decided that they didn't like those things. They didn't like welfare programs. They weren't wild about public education because it came with, if it came with integration. Um, they weren't wild about, um, you know, well, and that goes all the way back to like the 1930s when Northern Democrats were trying to pass things like um, uh, unemployment insurance and Southern Democrats in Congress in particular were opposing them if they would help African Americans out of poverty and away from the jobs that they had, you know, in the agricultural sector and the domestic sector. So there was even some racism if you go way back far enough, and we're opposed to government programs if they're going to undermine, you know, the natural order in the South um, and help African Americans out of poverty. So that when Southern evangelicals took over the pro-life movement, the call for more access to health care and welfare for the poor and better education in public schools, all of that kind of went out the window with it. And we got a drive to overturn Roe v. Wade with none of the other stuff that the Catholic Church had developed over centuries of concern about the flourishing of humanity. And that's worth reading. It'll, we'll, we'll put in the show notes. Uh, Caitlin, you, you thought that article was really interesting. Yeah, I just think it's really important that that describes that shift to Southern evangelicals as abstracting the issue of abortion away from a more robust theology of work and family and communities. And the history of Catholic social teaching is a good place, again, for us to go back to as a part of our history, too. I mean, that's much of that is, you know, modern times where we'd feel like, oh, we're Protestants, we're not Catholics. But if we're looking at the whole history of the global church for resources theologically to think about this, and we want abortion to be our our opposition to abortion to be rooted in a theology that really thinks about families and human communities in a more robust way, that will lead us to be probably against abortion and for restrictions against it, but also to be for, like Sky said, paid family leave policies, to have a stronger sort of social safety net for people, especially for vulnerable women. But I also think in relationship to all this, um, Tish Harrison Warren in her New York Times um, newsletter this week put a bunch of kind of responses to the leak from a bunch of different pro-life people, including people who are not Christians, including people who have very different kind of perspectives and places they're coming from in their pro-life stance. And I would recommend reading it. And one of the things that I really liked about it was Russell Moore's response really focused on, okay, if this happens, like we've said, it's an if, but if it happens post row, this is a vocational question for Christians. If you are pro-life, to think about what that means in all sorts of different areas of your life. I saw so many people on Twitter this week fighting about whether Christians are actually pro-life holistically. And I think part of the fight was some of us were thinking about it politically. Have you supported really holistically pro-life policies about paid family leave and social support? Or have you been pro-life individually or in your church? Has your church helped, you know, teenage moms or given to crisis pregnancy centers? And I think that's that there's something important there to think about if our political witness is consistent with our personal or individual witness. But I also think that's a question of vocation for us to be thinking, okay, if we have this holistic, robust theology of human flourishing communities, 
that might mean something different for someone who's going to show up at a political event or vote or write a letter to a senator, or it might mean volunteering at a crisis pregnancy center or doing some work in your church. And for us to all think, to be really honestly like on our knees asking God and with the contributions of our communities telling us what our gifts are and where we have time and resources to think about what vocationally it would mean for us to respond to this in a way that does reflect that more robust theology that I think we want to reclaim instead of just the political identity that it became. Yeah. And I think that it's your point, Caitlin, this is exactly what uh, the t- up until this point for the last 50 years, Christians could consider themselves pro-life because every two years they went into a voting booth and pulled yep. a lever. Yep. And if we really are moving into a post-row world, what it means to be pro-life can no longer just be, I pulled a lever yep. and now we're going to find out where the truth is. Just like 150 years ago, if you were an abolitionist, you could say, well, I voted for the anti-slavery candidate. Well, now all those slaves are free. What are you going to do? Well, they can't live in yeah. my neighborhood. I'm not going to help right. them. I'm not going right. to rebuild the South. I'm not going to integrate them into my community. Send them back to Africa. That's not an option here. We are called to love and care for these women, for their families, for their communities, for these kids. And um, my hope is in this moment, the church does step up and on all fronts, whether personally, corporately, and politically, we really work to create a culture of life rather than just pull a lever every two years. Right. And it's to our shame that we didn't do that already. Oh, okay. Well, on that note, <laughs> I guess we'll wrap it. What do you hope to see in the next, like in the next six months, if this actually comes through, uh, just like in a couple sentences, Sky, what do you want to see from the church this fall if Roe v. Wade is struck down? Uh, I want to see the, the, well, it depends on what altitude you're talking. I want to see the church in their local communities and in their states, which is where this battle now shifts, advocating for compassionate responses that have been proven to reduce the number of women pursuing abortions, regardless of whether those policies are associated with the right or the left. Mm-hmm. Okay. Caitlin, what about you? I mean, same. And I think what I would add to that is just, I want to see us grapple with because this particular issue has been such a significant part of the political theology legacy that we have inherited. I want to see us grapple with what are the theological foundations for the political positions that we have held. If they're not tenable, and I think for the most part they are not, what would it look like to not only with our actions, but also with the way we read the Bible, with the way that we teach theology, with the way that we talk about people and communities in our church communities, what would that look like that could be sustainably and holistically pro-life? Okay. All right. I think that was still one or two sentences. There was a lot. <laughs> Lots of there was a lot. There was a lot packed in there. Just a lot of commas. If okay. I don't pause to breathe, it's all one thing. So. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> now I know. Now I know. Uh, good. Do you think we made anyone mad? I don't think so. I think we're good. Are we clean? You think we're clean? Think, I don't think yeah, that was the goal. I, yeah. yeah, I don't know. That's not a good word. Any, okay. I don't like that. Thanks for listening. Uh, 56 minutes. That's uh, plenty. We're good. So there's a guest. Enjoy it. Uh, thanks for your support on Patreon. Sorry it took a long time to try to have a nuance, nuanced conversation about a very thorny topic, but we're not going to do hot takes and sound bites. And now Sky's going to cut out some sound bites to post on Twitter. And we will see you next week. <laughs> Bye. The Holy Post is brought to you by our listeners who support us on Patreon. This episode is also sponsored by our friends at Faithful Counseling. This is Phil. My wife Lisa and I got married young and we were a little bit immature. One of our parents gave us as a wedding gift a year of counseling. At first I thought, wait, what are you saying about my mental health? But the ability to talk to a counselor as issues came up in our lives and in our relationship was a huge help. Faithful Counseling is a Christian counseling service with more than 3,000 licensed therapists across all 50 states with access by video or phone sessions or even chat and text. With expertise in depression, stress, anxiety, trauma, family conflicts, and more, you can ask for a new counselor at any time and financial aid is available for those who qualify. Best of all, Holy Post listeners get 10% off your first month from our sponsor, Faithful Counseling. So what do you got to lose? Give it a try. Go to faithfulcounseling.com slash holy post. Just fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and you'll get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's faithfulcounseling.com slash holy post. And now back to the show.
My guest today is Dr. Mark Knoll, Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Notre Dame. For many years, he was a history professor at Wheaton College, and while there, he wrote perhaps his best-known book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. Well, he's back to talk about the 30th anniversary of that book, the impact it's had, and the way he has seen the growth of intellectual and scholarly engagement among evangelicals, which has been a really positive development. But the flip side of it is the new scandal of the evangelical mind is how the church itself has become captured by conspiracy theories, anti-intellectualism, and an unnuanced way of engaging our very complicated world. I was thrilled to have Dr. Noel on the show. He's been a huge influence on me through a number of his books about American history and the Civil War and the development of the evangelical tradition. So I hope you enjoy this conversation and he gives you some insight and perspective on how we got to this place in the history of the church in America. Here is Dr. Mark Knoll. Mark Knoll, welcome to the Holy Post. I'm glad to be with you today. So we're here because 30 years ago you wrote a book that has become, gosh, almost scripture for people in the area of history and religion and evangelicalism, and that is The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. I think I first encountered the book when I was a seminary student in the uh, early late 90s, early 2000s, and you've got a new updated version of it with a new foreword, a new afterword. But apart from those pieces, the book seems as relevant today as it was 30 years ago. Why, um, why the decision to re-release it now? There certainly was a, a sense by the part of the publisher that some of the issues, at least, that were addressed in the book remain current. And from my angle, um, I, I was uh, eager to talk about two things that were happening side by side, but that actually don't seem to be connected or don't seem to jive very well. On the one hand, are continuing issues in largely evangelical or evangelical-like communities, issues having to do with uh, matters of fact, issues having to do with um, attitudes toward contemporary science, uh, is issues having to do with things like uh, climate change or uh, racial issues that in many ways continue some of the problems, or at least some of the, the, the uh, issues leading to problems that I described in the book. Yet also, uh, in, by contrast, there has been in the last 30 years and more a real strong development of good first-order scholarship by people who are either willing to call themselves evangelical Christians or those who are kind of fellow travelers or somehow uh, related. Just as one example, over the last three decades, the Society of Christian Philosophers, which includes some really, really first-weight great thinking, has become one of, if not the largest, subunit in the uh, organization of philosophy, the philosophical uh, profession in, in uh, the United States. There are other, quite a few other examples that could be noted. So on the one hand, there's, there's a popular evangelical world that seems to be blown about by every wind of doctrine and now political allegiance. And there's an academic world where it's, it's not a renaissance and it's not a golden age, but there's just a lot of good examples of either uh, self-described evangelicals or people friendly to, or at least uh, empathetic toward evangelicals who are doing first-rate work. So that combination was what I wanted to emphasize particularly. Yeah, the, the soundbite that, if anybody's familiar with your book, the soundbite that we always take away from it is the scandal of the evangelical mind is that there's not much of an evangelical mind. And part of your goal with the book was to inspire uh, scholarship among evangelicals and, and serious scholarship. And it seems like in the last 30 years, there's been advancement there. Uh, there's, as you mentioned in the, in the afterword of your book, you list a whole bunch of different scholars who are either evangelical or maybe evangelical adjacent who have done fantastic work in the academy over the last number of decades. But there's this other thing going on, which it feels like popular evangelicalism is perhaps even less intellectually rigorous than it was 30 years ago. Um, you, you pose a question early in the book in the, in the uh, updated foreword about like basically is higher ed, is Christian higher ed not doing its job? Is it not effective? Because does it matter if this great stuff's happening in the academy if it's not trickling down into our churches? Yes, this is a, a really interesting uh, question that poses in some ways the same two-sided issues. There are what 
120, 130 colleges now in, in, in associated with the Christian College uh, organization. I'm not, is, it, is it Christian College something? Um, and almost all of the Coalition of Christian Colleges and Universities. There we go. There we go. CCCU. And, and yeah. In almost all of these, you can find uh, not just excellent teaching, not just uh, uh, faculty committed to the uh, moral and spiritual lives of their students, but some some really really good uh, scholarship, and then bro- broadening out, there there is uh, a, a, again a, any number of instances where where first order le- learning uh, goes on. But the question are the, are the colleges and this other kind of associated Christian learning is, is it not having an effect? Well, I think it is having an effect, but it's not the sort of effect that will feature on the evening news. It's not the sort of effect that is easily communicated through a Twitter uh, post. It's not the sort of of achievements that can um, easily be put into a sound bite or into a short, snappy uh, uh, statement for for instant communication. Yes, I think the the Christian colleges are, are doing a really good job. I think they're having an effect, but the effect they're having is much less noticeable than the storm and drong of of uh, the popular media and uh, political partisanship, political p- polemicizing that is also uh, going on. So, in the original version of uh, of your book, you you're a historian, so you trace how we got to this place, how the development of evangelicalism in, in the United States landed us in the late 20th century where we were. And one of the dynamics, and this is not unfamiliar to most people, is how much in generations past and centuries past, there was this very tight link between the church and higher education. Right. The example a lot of people like to give are the Ivy League schools in the Northeast, Harvard, most famous of all, having been started to train clergy. And over time, these universities and colleges sort of drifted from that Christian foundation and became secular. No one associates Harvard today with Orthodox Christianity in any significant way. I wonder if today we're seeing a similar dynamic, but it's almost the inverse, where we have this coalition of Christian colleges and universities and the scholars that inhabit them, many of whom are adhering closely to Orthodox Christian foundations for their work. But today we're watching the popular church drift away from Christianity as it becomes enamored with politics and secular values and the culture wars. And is that what's happening? Is it the inverse of the trend we saw a few hundred years ago? That's that's a very interesting way of posing uh, uh, an analysis of contemporary culture. Uh, Yes, uh, certainly there was a trickle down effect right back to the Middle Ages with with really university life beginning as an offshoot of of particularly Catholic uh, life. And then in the Reformation era, major colleges and universities being founded by the major Protestant places. And and it, it was still a, a time when leaders like Martin Luther and John Calvin were very frustrated that what they were hammering out as they thought well-considered theology uh, barely got to the, the congregations in the countryside and often in the cities where just a lot of uh, simple uh, superstition pre- prevailed in, in the churches. Now, do we have a reverse situation? Well, uh, yes and no. I mean, I, I do think the the, uh, the communication between Christian scholars who are careful, who want to uh, take what can be taken positively from the secular world, but also, also want to act with discrimination toward what they learn. I, I do think uh, that work is being reflected in the broader public. Um, uh, uh, a, 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 a historian at Wheaton College, right? Used to teach, for example, Tracy McKenzie has written a, a book published by University Press not not too long ago on uh, describing how, in the early 19th century, uh, American ideals ideas about individuals shifted from thinking that people needed constraint, needed to have uh, their mistakes or evil checked, to to an idea that people were basically good and just were hurt by the environment. Well, that. That's a, a book well grounded in scholarship, but presented in a popular way. That's received a great deal of attention, relatively speaking. Yeah, we had him on. We had him on this show not long right, ago. Right. So, so, but not nearly as much attention as what would be would be gained from <laughs> one short segment on CNBC or one short segment on Fox Television or or one right. 
one uh, tweet that goes out to six million people with somebody saying something outrageous about something that 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 uh, grips people viscerally. So, I think that the the landscape of public communication has become more complicated, more diversified, and more open to more voices, even rapidly in, in the last thirty years. And that that's made the, the excellent question that you raise hard hard to answer. Is part of the problem uh, just the very nature of evangelicalism itself? Uh, you you document throughout your book the, the sort of populist impulses of evangelicalism, and, and that feeds right into Tracy McKenzie's book as well. And in the new afterward, you quote an email that you received from George Marsden, and he, he says this, quote, evangelicalism is strong because it can evangelize every tribe and nation. It is weak because being market-driven, it cannot challenge most tribal prejudices and will even reinforce those when plausible to do so. In other words, to put it in, in kind of my language, is evangelicalism in a way doomed because it lives by the market, but it also dies by the market? And so that, that populist impulse means scholarship and, and elite thinking is just not, it's, it's not the currency of the faith. Yes. Um... Yes, oh, certainly, there's an awful, awful lot to your way of, of posing that question. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, evangelical Christianity became important in United States history, and this is this is an importance for uh, Black Americans as well as white Americans, was that <clears throat> evangelical groups led by the Methodists and the Baptists, Disciples of Christ, and eventually some, some help from the more established uh, Protestant churches, <clears throat> evangelical churches exploited the open space of American separation of church and state, American religious freedom, brilliantly. So the European right. pattern the European pattern had been to wait for government sponsorship, to wait for approval from the main universities, to, to wait until your bishop or your presbytery or your, your association told you you could do something. Americans had, didn't do that at all. It was, it was ordinary people simply taking up the Lord's work, the Methodists in the lead, but a lot in, in, behind. And that, that was a, a, a tremendous success in terms of enlisting believers. The proportion of the American population uh, legitimately attached to churches rose much faster than the spectacularly fast rise of the American population. Okay, that's the positive side of right. Evangelical flexibility, what, what George referred to as all things to all people. And for the first maybe <clears throat> two thirds of the 19th century, that style, populist, intuitive, Bible only, comported quite well with the kind of teaching that was present in the still very small uh, American world of, of higher education. Toward the end of the 19th century, things began to change. Views of science, that had fit very well with uh, all sorts of Christian teaching, began to shift. It was the era when the higher uh, criticism of Scripture began to question some of the traditional beliefs about the reliability of, of the Bible. It was an era when uh, the, the, the pluralization of American population, many more uh, immigrants who were not Protestants of European background, were not Protestant at all, Jewish, Orthodox, Non-believing immigration became uh, a much greater factor in those uh, decades, and that that was a situation in which the, uh, the the evangelical traditions, denominations, organizations began to lose their dominance in, in the in the culture. So, what do you do when you uh, have had a prominent central position and it begins to slip away? Well, there were some really serious evangelical Christian responses, but there are a lot of kind of panic responses. And eventually we get to yeah. the, the fundamentalist movement, which I try to talk about at some length in the, in, in the book, which again has many positive features. Uh, you have to have a supernatural Bible if you're going to have, have Christianity. You have to believe in the, uh, the, the atonement won by Christ if, if you're going to be a true Christian. That, those things were things fundamentalists stuck up for. But they also stuck up for them using the intuitive, uh, uh, Bible-only way of approaching life in general that had been so spectacularly successful with the whole nation in the first 50 years of, of United States history. And, and 
that those re- relying on those same things meant that, that there was going to be a clash of culture. And the clash of culture would be addressed not in uh, careful picking again and choosing good and bad from what was coming in, in modern uh, academic life, modern science, but as a kind of frightened uh, nervousness about uh, all sorts of uh, modern things. While at the same time, however, uh, unselfconsciously adopting much that was modern. What, what, what was good about evangelical in a certain, uh, white evangelical particularly in a certain setting, proved to be a deficit in, in the, the more modern setting. And, and as you say, that, that, uh, uh, those historical developments then, then cast doubt on the character, quality, instincts of evangelical Christianity as a whole. I, I would say myself that, that uh, when defined theologically, evangelicalism is just as much today a potent, reliable, authentic expression of Christian faith as, as any other. Defined sociologically and politically, however, we have a different uh, story almost entirely. What is, as everyone knows, white evangelical since the 1970s and 80s has a particular social, political, cultural meaning that is, I would say, only loosely related to the core meanings of evangelical Protestantism that had developed since the 18th century. Yeah, this is a debate that honestly has gone back for us to the very beginning of this podcast 10 years ago, we've constantly talked about how useful is this term evangelical? Should we preserve it? Should we jettison it? Is it helpful in a theological and historical sense, but no longer in a popular or cultural sense? And and you certainly frame that well in the book. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, it, it has taken on, I can't use the word in popular discourse much anymore because it's so freighted with things I don't intend. But let me back up a second, because I'm glad you brought up the early 20th century and some of the fundamentalist response to the challenges they were facing culturally and and demographically with immigration and intellectually, certainly. Thinking back to my first reading of your book 20 plus years ago, you had an analogy in the book that just stayed with me, and forgive me if I don't get it perfectly right, but you compared what the church was facing at that time to a cancer patient and the need for, for drastic treatment to save the patient's life. Sometimes it requires amputation, surgery, whatever. And fundamentalism comes along and says, we need to preserve Orthodox Christian belief, things like supernaturalism, the authority of scripture, the belief in the resurrection, those those fundamentals of the faith. And on the plus side, the patient survived. We're still here. But the negative side is that what fundamentalism chose to amputate was our mind. It kind of took away our intellectual capacity because there was it was seen as a threat that if you engage in higher scholarship and you encounter ideas that are contrary to Orthodox Christianity, it's intrinsically dangerous. We can't afford to do that. And so we've lived with the the effect of that amputation ever since, where there is this deep suspicion of elites, this deep suspicion of scholarship and and the academy. And it's left us with this uh, anemic form of populist Christianity that doesn't know how to discourse in a in a really diverse society of, of of people and ideas. I ask, I bring that all up because I'm wondering: Are we in that again that that same fearful state? And what are we at risk of amputating this time around, a hundred years later? Yes, uh, that's a well-posed historical question. I think what I'd like to do is to talk about conservative Protestant, evangelical Protestants' uh, attitudes towards science, and particularly evolutionary science, as a way of of, uh, tying together what happened in the late 19th century and what may be happening uh, uh, today. So until, until we get into the 1920s, and this, this is actually a very well established historical matter that is that doesn't needs to be <laughs> needs to have much much greater uh, currency in the general public until we get to the late 19 teens and early 1920s there is no uh, across the board conservative protestant rejection of evolution to preserve supernaturalism seemed to many of the leaders of fundamentalism in the 20s 30s and to some extent up to this day it was necessary to reject evolution entirely because some in the 
wider academic world treated evolution as a philosophical rejection of any kind of divine oversight over the natural world. As, as a lot of good philosophers, some of whom are not even Christian, a lot of good philosophers have pointed out that conclusion goes far, far beyond the uh, necessary conclusions to be drawn from the evidence by people who study uh, the actual uh, character of species and, and life development all its form. Okay, yeah. so we have the situation. That hold, hold. If, I can, if I can just repeat back what I think I hear you saying is early on, there was an acceptance of a more nuanced and discerning engagement with both scripture and science or scripture right, right. and this I mean, emergent theory of evolution. But when- Not everywhere and not with all communities, but, but with intellectual leaders and not only intellectual leaders, but Christian leaders who were articulating and defending a very high view of biblical inspiration. Yes, exactly. So we, we come then closer to the present, and there's still a, a, a real kind of uh, widespread skepticism. Not so much today, I would say, about evolution, although in some corners of the Christian world, that's still very well. I, I, I understand that there are an awful lot of people come to the, the uh, uh, Noah's Ark Park in, 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 in Kentucky a lot more than go go to like the Smithsonian Institution in, in D.C., uh, but but in our day there there, there are uh, Christian groups like BioLogos who who are in a sense picking up the mantle of what Warfield and James Orr and, and uh, Asa Gray and other really serious Christian scientists and theologians interested in science from that, that early period and the BioLogos people is well known they're saying well. We certainly reject any view of the natural world that rejects God, but there's a lot of well-grounded, empirically verified aspects of modern evolutionary theory that we can accept. In our own day, uh, we would add to evolutionary science, uh, uh, scientific studies about uh, climate change. And, and again, uh, there are a, a lot of serious Christian believers, many of them who I'd identify as evangelicals, who, who say... Uh, the the, the well-verified science points to uh, the, the unescapable conclusion that human activity has contributed to the climate change, the changes that we see and the effects that we see. And uh, there is also, however, a large uh, group in the, in the Christian community that says, no, 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 the, the climate change science is all bogus. It's, it's all a way of just manipulating people and trying to get big government to do uh, unworthy things. Well, in some sense, that kind of all or nothing rejection carries on the non-discriminating, non-differentiating record of how fundamentalist communities handle evolution from the 20s, in some ways, to the present. So, yes. So, I think the, what you the common theme I... Go ahead. Sorry. The, 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 the common theme I hear you drawing out of that experience 100 years ago and what we're seeing today is fear. That fear leads groups to simplified answers and a rejection of, of complication and nuance. Back then, it may have been fear of scientific and, and, and philosophical values that were riding the coattails of Darwinianism and, and modernity. But today, it feels like it's political fears that are causing a lot of evangelicals to no longer, the example that comes to my mind right now is, is critical race theory, CRT. Uh, I've had conversations with numerous guests about this, and certainly there are extreme philosophical forms of critical race theory that are problematic, but scholars and others acknowledge that there's actually some benefit to engaging this theory and understanding it with a Christian worldview and point of view. But for a lot of popular Christians, it's uh -uh -uh, anything remotely CRT or anything that's even about racial justice is now, you know, antichrist. It's it's to be shunned completely, and it's this very fearful response that shuts down you know, the the higher work of the mind that wants to engage in diverse ideas and wrestle with them. Is that the common theme? I, I think it is. Uh, and, and again, the, the, the current discussions over critical race theory seem to be quite a direct analogy to uh, scientific discussions late 19th, early 20th century. There, in that period, uh, some secular scientists and more secular philosophically minded people said, 
Well, if evolution is true, it means there can't be any God. There was a whole raft, however, of Christian respondents said, no, 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 let's look at it carefully. When we say evolution, what do we mean? And then they said, well, we, ha we have to mean things that are uh, studied carefully in the, the proper way of examination and then testing, testing conclusions and retesting conclusions. And it, it, that kind of uh, response would be the same thing today when uh, critical race theory is raised. Rather than um, immediately reacting in fear as if there's a, a new and damaging and all controlling effort to uh, redefine American history, we say, well, what, what do we mean? Uh, look, look at uh, uh, housing restrictions in the major American cities. Well, the re good research shows that until very, re very recently, but then, then just a matter of years, there was systematic <clears throat> discrimination against non-white people and their ability to buy homes where white people could buy their homes. Is, is that caving in to uh, something pernicious? Uh, look, look, look at uh, uh, government uh, programs as recent as the Second World War. Uh, the GI Bill helped hundreds of thousands of former soldiers and sailors to get a college education. A very tiny proportion went to black veterans because the, the way that program was set up discriminated against African Americans who'd served in the military. Th that, that conclusion is demonstrable in research study after research study. T to draw that conclusion is by no means to say that this kind of discriminatory behavior characterizes all of American history or, or that American history is only a history of white suppression of non-whites, but it is to say well-established, well-researched, well-documented history shows some systematic patterns of discrimination against African Americans. So to, to be in a panic about an all-embracing theory that is believed to be a, a conspiracy to take away uh, the best of American history and to organize all of contemporary life to serve only a, a, a woke few that kind of fear is just, it's just, it's, it's not part of the Christian faith. It, it should not be the way in which believers approach complex issues of contemporary life and morality. Okay. In our final minutes, I want to um, go a little bit autobiographical here because I think it summarizes these two options that stand in front of the church today. In the book, you write this, this is a quote. I was brought up in a Christian environment where, because God had to be given preeminence, nothing else was allowed to be important. I've broken through to the position that because God exists, everything has significance. It feels like those are the two options in front of us as Christians. One option is to say we have to keep God above all else so nothing else matters, which means intellectual engagement with all these nuanced and complicated ideas of the world should just be ignored completely. Or we can go down the road of, because God exists, all the world matters, and we need to love him with our minds and engage in this complicated reality of a pluralistic society and the nuances of history and science and, and the intellectual engagement of the world. What, what makes somebody choose that better road like you chose, rather than the more insular fundamentalist road that shuts down that kind of curiosity? What, what makes us choose the right road? Uh, of course, that's a loaded question, and I can only give a, my prejudiced personal answer. But but it, it, that's what my, I want. And and my thinking, uh, the basis of the Christian faith, is that God in Christ reconciled the world to Himself. And then, if I read in the first chapter to the Epistle to the Colossians, the Apostle Paul saying, "All things were made by Christ, and all things hold together in Him." The statements are unequivocal. I've, I've tried to develop this idea in a, in a whole other book called Jesus Christ and the Life of the Mind. But if, if, if Christian belief entails the affirmation that all things were made by Christ and that all things hold together in him, then, then clearly, to my, in my mind anyways, clearly the Christian's duty, obligation, privilege, is to examine all things 
to see how they work, to see how God has made the world. And of course, with discrimination, with, with discernment, not going necessarily the way of the world and thinking that the world operates on its own. And if we find out more about the world, we, we reduce God. But my Christian belief is the, the more we find out about the world, the more we find out about how human societies work, the more we find out about the, the, the structure of the human psyche, the more we find out about how God in Christ made the world and God in Christ sustains the world. And that's my uh, a belief that, that uh, lies behind the affirmation that Christian believers should be the most open to new discoveries, the most open to at least try out new proposals that come from science and other domains, and the least fearful as they engage in those activities. Amen. Well, Dr. Noel, I, I'm really grateful for the work you've done in, in history. I was a history major undergrad. I've always been curious about why are things the way they are. Your books have been immensely helpful, both about the Civil War, American religious history. And for the many people who listen to this podcast and are wondering, how did we get here? And why are we struggling in our churches and communities with conspiracy theories and unnuanced thinking and constant fearfulness? You have got to read The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. It is essential reading to explain how we got to where we are. And even though the book is 30 years old, it's as relevant as ever. And especially with the new edition that you've, um, the new things you've written for this new edition, it's just, it's a fantastic resource. Thank you so much for doing it. And thank you for your contribution to this very thing you're talking about over your time at Wheaton College and, and Notre Dame. It's just a delight. And I'm indebted for sure for all that you've uh, created and contributed. So thanks for being a part of the show. Well, thank, thank you very much and, and every blessing as you continue with these efforts. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Holy Post Media. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash Holy Post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, Holy Post merchandise, and much more. 